Welcome to another episode of Kits and Cruising. Now your TV guide might tell you that this week we're supposed to be off-roading. However, due to a sort of British rail leaves type situation, we've been muddied off, so we can't do it. So what we've done is come down here to Exeter in preparation for next week's show, the Exeter Kit Car Show Special. One car, however, that you won't see at that show is the fabulous Clan, a classic kit that I took a look at just last week. Some manufacturers come within a gnat's dangly of making it big time, only to be hoist of their own petard by some appalling twist of fate or circumstances beyond their control. This is precisely what happened to clan cars of Washington County Durham. Let your mind drift back down to the 60s. In those days, if you wanted a cheap, affordable sports car, you were stuck with a Triumph Spitfire or an MG Midget. Into this little lot came the Clan. Launched with minimum fuss, it had futuristic styling. Wedge shape might not look a million dollars now, but it preempted the Fiat X19 by five years. The TR7 hadn't been thought of, and as far as the Esprit or the Countach wedge shapes were concerned, they weren't even a gleam in the designer's eye. Sports cars had 7 inch headlamps on sit up and beg wings, so you have a little groundbreaker here. We're looking at a groundbreaker in other ways too. The clan had a glass fibre monocoque, meaning that the plastic body shell doubled as a structural member, just like a modern tin box saloon. Only two manufacturers have made cars this way, Lotus beating Rochdale's Olympic to the market by a matter of months. certainly can be used as an everyday car, but providing you're quite happy to spend a few hours doing little minor jobs to it, then it is a very economical form of transport. But routine servicing of the older car needs to be done a bit more frequently. Uh, apart from that, just the normal things of keeping it clean and tidy and polished, um, no more difficult than any other car. The lightweight plastic shell gave an all-up weight of 650 kilos. This, when it was allied to the 850cc Hillman Imp engine, gave performance that was at least equal to a Triumph Spitfire 1500. Not only that, but it gave you 40 miles to the gallon, magnificent road holding, and of course, it was rust free. No, they're not, not expensive at all. Um, obviously, being an older car, then they can come from in, in need of complete restoration through to, to fully uh, finished and usable items. And it can range anything from a couple of hundred pounds up to four or five thousand pounds. It's not difficult getting parts. Um, the car used parts to many other different manufacturers. Um, yes, some are harder to get these days, but the, the club has a very good spares operation. And some of the more difficult parts, then we actually get remanufactured. So what exactly went wrong? How did the clan nearly go to the wall? Well, the 70s weren't exactly kind to British sports cars. The 1973 fuel crisis has a lot to answer for. It saw Jensen to the wall. The 50 mile an hour speed limit imposed by the government did nothing at all for sports car imagery. But it wasn't that that killed the clan. What really saw it off was VAT a little dodge imposed by the Conservative government to Im improve on their revenue um, from the old purchase tax days. Now that was a loophole that Lotus had already found. You could save 25% on the cost of your car if you built some parts of it yourself, thus the invention of the kit form car. Clan went up the same route, did the same thing. Sadly, when VAT came in, they hadn't got any pricing policy that would stand up to the increased outflow. Hence, no clan. 73, they go to the wall, into receivership. Moulds and jigs get bought by this Cypriot company, who lobbed the lot over there just in time to get overrun by the Turks, and once more the poor clan suffered. But in part two, we'll tell you about how the clan resurfaced in Northern Ireland. The 
Jaguar SS100 was a classic from the day it was launched. Capable of 100 miles an hour, which was impressive in its day, William Lyon's masterpiece has set the standard followed by every Jaguar sports car since, being blessed with graceful lines and a good ride handling compromise. The problem for even the quite wealthy car enthusiast is that the SS100 costs over £150,000 at auction these days, assuming you can find one for sale at all, that is. This may be the answer, the Suffolk SS100, which is funny enough, built in Suffolk. Beneath the dimensionally accurate GRP bodywork, you will find the Jaguar running gear from the XJ6. There's a steel substructure underneath the bodywork, which mounts onto the sturdy box section chassis. The layman would be hard pressed to tell this from the real thing. It may be a tiny bit tricky to get into, but once you're inside, it doesn't disappoint. You really feel like you're driving a vintage car. You could be back in 1936 when the real SS100 was launched. And when you fire her up, you hear the burble of the Jaguar XK straight six. We've just come in from the cold and I'm here with Roger Williams so that he can tell us a little bit more about his company. So when did you start this company? I took over the production in 1995 and uh, we're producing the cars now and into the future. It's a bit of a long story, but I went down and saw the man who originally used to make them. And uh, he was involved in two other engineering enterprises and he really hadn't got the time to devote to this. So I tried to buy it off him and initially he was very uh, reserved about the idea, but gradually I wore him down and after 18 months he said okay and I took the company over and uh, we are now very busy making the replica that you see here. Talk me through a bit, I mean, how does it, where do you literally start from the, the actual body when you, you just build up as you go along, just talk me through a few of these cars. Well we start with a bare chassis and we have the chassis made out by a subcontractor and they come to us like this and they're all painted up so that uh, they resist the, uh, the rust. And then we move next to the stage where we build up the four corners, as you see here. And this particular car has got uh, the front disc brakes and the suspension now attached to it. And gradually the car gets built up with its donor components. These come off the XJ6. They're all fully reconditioned by us before they're, recondition before they're refitted to the car. New disc brakes, hubs all reconditioned, all new bearings, seals, bushes. And uh, this point in time we start adding to some of the fakery that we put on the car which makes you think that the car is original. So here we have a dummy of the Andre Hartford shock absorbers uh, that were used on the car back in 1938. When the car finishes its construction process that looks to all the world like the uh, fr friction dampers that were originally fitted to the cars back in 1938. From that stage we then move on to the car that's got its engine gearbox and uh, differential all assembled. This particular car is going out to America for an American customer and he wants the car to look as English as possible. So uh, we're putting all the features that we put on this and even little touches like uh, the SS badge that we put on the uh, oil filler will all be part of the uh, car when it's finished for him. Will he, have, will he have the steering change as well? He can have the car's left-hand drive at this stage in time. He's not quite sure whether he wants it left-hand drive or right-hand drive, but that's a decision which he can make after we've fitted the bodywork to the car. And uh, So they really, how much are they made to order then? How many Each car is individual. I, re I treat each order as individual and everything you see here is sold or allocated to a customer. We don't have any stock. We're not building uh, cars on a spec basis. Everything we make is, has got a customer's name on it. Do you have things you won't do? Do you sometimes say, no, we won't do that colour or that's just not authentic? Well, I've always managed to persuade a potential customer that we should only build the car as perfectly as possible. Some people want to cut corners and put cheaper lights and cheap fittings on them. And I say, well, you're going to destroy the future value of this car and some of your enjoyment because if you take it to a Jaguar rally, and somebody says, oh, it's got the wrong lights on it, or it's got the wrong seats in it, you're then going to feel uncomfortable as an owner if you've done that. So I encourage them all, and they all do. 
they, they follow my advice. Most people are quite sensible about it and they spend a lot of time here. We encourage them to come here to drive the car. I've never sold a car except one, which is this one that going to America, where the customer never drove it or saw it before he decided to buy. But typically a customer comes here and he'll spend anything up to four hours with us on his first visit. He'll then make his decision whether he wants to buy it. And if he does want to buy it, I say, right, get your camera, take as many photographs as you like. This place is home and it will be home for them if they decide to build a car for about 12 or 18 months, which is a typical customer build period, because we don't encourage people to rush the process of building it because they've got an anniversary date or a particular deadline they want to follow. We say, look, enjoy the building process. We'll make all the parts for you and you can in complete your car at home and it's your car and it's very much then, hopefully, a part of their family life. And so we get involved in the things that they're doing in their family as a result of them building the car. You're going to have to start a Suffolk club, aren't you? Well, I'm resisting that, <laughs> although a lot of owners have asked me to do something about it. I genuinely feel that the car has a wider interest than just having a little local SS clique. So I encourage them all to join the Jaguar Drivers Club, where there is a proper historic right. register. And this is one of the few cars that's accepted by the Jaguar Drivers Club as a proper historic replica. Oh, and the cars, the new oh yes, because the car is visually perfect to the original, it is the, and, and of course it's all full of Jaguar parts, it's really just a reclothed Jaguar. So right. they accept the car as a replica, along with some, certain very good D-types and C-types that are built. And the cars are welcome at rallies. And indeed, there's a car just over there, which we're building for a gentleman up north who saw one of our cars that had been built by an owner at home three years ago. He saw the car on a rally this year. He and his wife both fell in love with the car and they came over here in September and ordered one. And I've got to get it built for them for next March so they can go on the same rally next year that they were also on this year and some owners customise them with their own particular piece, pieces of period um, car furniture and they look even more original than this does. How much does it cost to get one of these out onto the road? Well if a customer builds it himself he can build it and be on the road for in the region of 30 to 32,000. If we build a car here it's closer to 45,000 right. but that's really a reflection of the labour cost involved and uh, the time it takes to do it. The customer, of course, is investing his own labour at no cost. So what would you say that this car offers an enthusiast that maybe they wouldn't get if they have the original? Well, the problem with the original is that most of them are now in collections or museums or, or they're locked away. They're very seldom seen out. And if you go to a Jaguar rally day, unless it's a specific day for SS100s and the SS Mark, it's not very likely you're going to see more than one and even then you might not see any. But with this car, there are now a number of them about, and we're looking towards about 60 cars on the road of, of the production in the next few years. And so they get around to rallies, but the people who tend to buy the car are typically 50 to 60 years old. They've got the time, and of course they've got the money, and they want a car that they can go rallying with, and they want a car that they can enjoy. It's a car to drive, and the proof of the pudding really is in how the car drives. This really is a painless way to capture the long lost era of motoring and with the XK6 running gear you won't face any of the reliability problems you would with a real SS100 and you won't worry about driving your investment. But this kit is not quite as expensive as $150,000 you'd pay for the real thing. And on style, well, it's got to have 10 out of 10. I'm with John Cook, the organiser of the Axel and Taxi to show. John, tell me, how long does it take to put this together? 
well, a show like this is ongoing. It's such a such a massive show. Uh, we've got over over 50 manufacturers here, which makes it, ooh, you know, a, a big show. Oh. Um, lots of trade stands all selling their end of lines ready for the end of the year. Yeah, so there's uh, we're hoping for hordes of people coming in tomorrow to see these wonderful cars. How long has this show been going? How long has it been in existence? Took a chance five years ago, so we're in our, our fifth year. When the Bristol show shut down, oh. um, I decided that, yes, there's still a market down this end of the country. Unfortunately, we've been proven right. Well, as by the manufacturers and the public, are you expecting more public than ever before? Well, yes, um, we're hoping to broach the 8,000 this year. Um, we was up to about seven last year. But uh, with a, such a storming interest in the show, um, I've had to turn manufacturers down and trade stands wow. down. We've got a waiting list, so it, it says something about the kit car industry and the way things are going. Certainly. Know? Of course, particular interest to our viewers, there's a couple of new models here today, or tomorrow, because it's the night before, but uh, got a couple of nice things we've seen. That's right. Well, this is what's so exciting about the industry. Um, you can go to classic car shows and you can see the same car day in and day out, but you come to a kit car show and you just never know what to expect. I mean, we've got a car, I think it's called a Lorini. It's that new that nobody's ever seen it before. It's a little bit Elise-like, yes, uh, say no more. Um, Volkswagen-based, absolutely a little stunner it is, and I think it will go on. It is extremely yellow. Extremely yellow. It's very yes, yellow. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll pick up a bit more on that tomorrow. So you thought the clan was dead when we last left the story. Think again. what happened for the next 10 years? Well, actually, absolutely nothing, until a guy called Peter McCandless surfaced in Northern Ireland, started a company called Clan Cars Limited, with a ton of money from the Northern Ireland Development Council, it's pretty much the same people who at that time were pouring money into a company called DeLorean, and he set off all over again. Clan Cars Limited marketed a new car. Actually the same car but with a lot of detail and styling improvements. They got rid of the upright noddy type headlights and put in these nice pop-up units. A lot of styling changes smoothed the car out and also extended the line of the car. Quality was on the up by this time. Having said that, the car still used the original imp engines and running gear. There was a problem. These began to get very rare. Imps became sought after and collectible, no more a cheap car to buy. A solution had to be found. And this is it, the Clan Clover. Lovely little car, but of course, you know, all kit car manufacturers are actually turnkey manufacturers in disguise, in the wings waiting to happen, wannabes. And this is no different from Peter McCandless. He spent a fortune type approving this car, probably too much because his cash flow went to hell and back. Anyway, in the meantime, they produced the Clover, a sweet little number. But gone was the imp material and in came Alpha Sud running gear. A lot wider track, so they put these blisters on the back here to cover that width. Better road holding, of course. In goes the 1.5 litre double overhead cam Alpha engine. Tremendous, sounds sensational. Beautiful little power plant, torquey and everything. The press really, really liked it. Few niggles, sure, but what doesn't? Trouble was the public didn't like it, and by 1985 it was the same old story with Clan. They went bust. Now opinions divided as to what is the best Clan of all time. Some say the Clover, some say the Irish Clan, some say the original Clan. Myself, I'm a Crusader fan, that's the original. Neil, our producer, is a Clover man. But whichever way you cut it, 
these clans are great little cars and a tremendous buy. Well, that's the way it should look. Let's go and see how Neil's getting on with ours. Progress is finally being made with the Jester, and as you can see, we've got the rear tub in, which is a GRP moulding that just sits onto the chassis. Now, it comes oversized, and you've got a trim line that's marked along the edge, and basically, you just have to take it back to that, make it nice and tidy, sit it in, mark it up where it lines up with the chassis, drill through, put some um, bonding agent underneath just to seal it, and then rivet it through. Nice and simple, no problems there, and it gives you a nice, neat little moulding around the fuel filler neck and things like that, so it all looks neat and tidy, and that's a boot area. All in, ready to go. Now this furry stuff here is nothing to do with the kit whatsoever. It's a brainstorm of mine. Um, I'm going to make my own hood for this car, and I'll show you how that went in June in the next series, but basically, it does away with all the poppers, and we've got a solid rail onto which the hood is mounted and it gives you tension all the way around but I'll explain all that in June, that's nothing to do with the build at this stage we just needed to get these mouldings done before the car goes for paint and the pressure's now on to get the car ready for paint and to that end there's a few bits to show you, starting over here as with any kit build we've reached that stage now where we've got those fiddly little jobs that seem to take forever and this is one of them this is the instrument binnacle from the Dona Fiesta that we stripped down at the beginning of the series. Now, what we've got to do, and we have done, is cut a slot in here for it to fit into the dash moulding for the Jester. Now, it's a good idea to fit these again, but there's no actual mention in the instructions how that's supposed to fit. Now, it's the little detailed jobs like this on a kit build that take for ages, and you never seem to make any progress, but if you get them right, it makes all the difference to the quality of the car that you're going to live with at the end of the day. Another thing we've done, we've bonded in the windscreen frame. As you can see, it's nice and solid. We've basically taped off the bottom here and made a resin soup. Now what that consists of is fiberglass resin. We get some little chopped strands of fiberglass, pour it in, mix it all up till it thickens up. And then we've dabbed it in here. And as you can see, that is pretty solid. Mm -hmm. 